I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Mom of two, Mi Jung Lee, is an award-winning reporter and anchor for CTV News Vancouver. It's her dream job, which is awesome. Her investigative reports covering issues like massage parlors and businesses defrauding taxpayers have won numerous RTDNA awards for excellence in journalism. Beginning her broadcast career in 1990 at Czech TV, she moved to BC TV in 1992. She has been anchor on Vancouver Television's VTV, the host of Canada AM, Western Edition, and anchor and producer at CTV News at 11.30 p.m. After her battle with breast cancer in 2013, Mi Jung works to raise awareness about the disease through sharing her own identity. Please join me in welcoming Mi Jung Lee. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, I have two teenage boys, aged 15 and 17, and everyone tells me, oh, you know what? It's a lot easier raising boys as teenager than girls. I'm going, okay, um, show of hands, who thinks it's easier raising boys than girls? Uh, okay. Uh, Joanne, my friend Joanne's out here. You've got a boy and a girl. What's easier, raising a boy or a girl? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, you know, with girls, I'm told it's the drama, it's the emotional roller coaster, the emotional volatility. But you know, with boys, it can be the opposite inertia. <laughs> um, you know, their days can be just all about monosyllabic answers to every question that you give them. Sometimes it's not even words, it's just two letters and a number, like <laughs> PS4. Sometimes they make me LOL, other times they make me FOL. Okay, that's a new one, it's freak out loud. But one day stands out in my mind when FOL was absolutely justified. Our oldest son left really early that morning on his bike, it was like 6 a.m. or something, and he had an early class, so we didn't think too much about it. He was in high school at the time. Um, we thought, oh wow, isn't that great? You know, he's riding his bike to school. You know, at our kid's school, when a student is absent, they call home. So, and we can retrieve our messages from work. And so there's an automated voicemail message on our home machine. And it's an automated voice that said on our machine that they, um, a student in your household was absent for period one, period two, period three. <laughs> I'm thinking, what is going on? You know, with both parents working, it can be a challenge to deal remotely with issues. You feel helpless. But there is one app that, you know, can help when you're feeling helpless. It's called Find My P Friends. Have you heard of this one? It can ease some of the pain. If your kids have an iPhone, you can use GPS to find out exactly where they are. So we did that. So we're looking him up, Sunshine Coast. I'm going. <laughs> What? The Sunshine Coast? Um, it's a school day and my teenage son is in Gibson's, okay? Um, no, he was not abducted. There was no need for an Amber Alert. He went on his own free will with a friend. It was kind of a Ferris Bueller's day off. So you can imagine how furious we were. I thought, how narcissistic of him. But you know, teenagers are narcissistic. That's why they drive around with cars that have N on them, you know? <laughs> I said, how could we have raised such a self-centered teenager? Later that evening, we sat and talked with him. Well, talked might be a bit of a euphemism. We punished him and knock on wood, he hasn't pulled that kind of stunt again. But the bigger issue is parents, how are we going to raise a child who is not so self-focused who is not so narcissistic, and who thinks of the community. Well, living by example is key. If, you want my, if I want my child to be aware of the community, I have to behave that way. I have to lead by example. Let's face it, as adults, we're pretty self-centered, but we've replaced the self with family. We become family-centered. And very few of us actually Think of the wider community. You know, hitting a like button on Facebook or Instagram does not count for being an agent of change. I mean, voter turnout in BC was 52%. The Vancouver civic election, the voter turnout was 43%. You know, we're a pretty apathetic lot. 
For the average person, complacency only gets shoved aside when there's a crisis. Now my job is to interview or tell stories about people who have been shaken out of their normal routines. Sometimes it's a tragedy. One of the toughest things about being a journalist is to interview a grieving parent. I used to feel bad asking. I don't feel so bad now because often in their darkest moments, people want to tell their story. Sometimes in our deepest personal crisis, we feel most connected with our community. When the storm is raging within, we reach out for that life preserver. And sharing one's story allows someone to put their hand out and prevent us from drowning. That's when we really understand community. When the community rallies around a grieving family, that family's lifted up. And I've seen that many times as a reporter. Why does a family who has lost a child talk to the media about a, their son's overdose? Recently, a 17-year-old Burnaby boy died after he took fentanyl. His grief-stricken family went on the news to warn other people about the dangers of drug use. In the middle of their unspeakable pain, they spoke out. Friends of ours who live in Calgary also had a son who took fentanyl. Anthony Hampton's 18 years old. His mother found him in his room turning blue. She had to do CPR to save his life. But he suffered brain damage, and now he has to learn to walk again. They recently told their story on CTV. They said they wanted something positive to come out of something so terrible. For years, I interviewed people who were broken, but they spoke out so they could fix someone else, so they could save a life. I didn't realize that one day I would also have that opportunity. It was a sunny June afternoon two years ago, 4 o'clock. A busy CTV newsroom was getting noisier as reporters and writers were getting ready for the show. And I was getting ready to anchor CTV News at 5 that day. Makeup, hair all in place, ready to face the TV world. But then my cell phone rang. It was my doctor, and he was confirming the biopsy results. The lump that I had found on my left breast was cancer. I felt like saying to God, um, there's been some mistake here. I report the bad news. I'm not supposed to be the subject of the bad news. That's not what I signed up for in journalism school. You know, I'm used to crafting other people's stories and neat two-minute reports. I like being in control of the story. Suddenly, I was facing the start of my own story, and I had no idea what the journey would be except that it wouldn't be easy and it wouldn't be just two minutes. My first hurdle was the five o'clock show, though. I, you know, would I be able to get through anchoring it? I just had an hour to go. I managed to read the newscast, chit-chat with the weatherman, and not become a heap of tears on live television. You know, it's not good for the mascara. You know, I held it together and got through the show. And later that evening at home came the tough part, telling our boys. They were 13 and 15 at the time. My husband told them at the dinner table, trying to be as positive as possible. I didn't want to have to tell them because I knew I'd start crying. I could see the boys were fighting back the tears. I tried putting my fear in an internal compartment and prayed to God to help me be strong. You know, friends connected me with other women who had had similar experiences. They generously gave their time to talk to me and I was touched. I talked with a friend who had gone through breast cancer. She introduced me to another friend. We actually all lived on the same street. You know, I called it my cancer club. Um, <laughs> it's not a club that anyone wants to join. It sounds pretty depressing, but it was actually such a great source of strength. We talked and walked for hours, and we agreed on a few things. We agreed that doing searches on the internet late at night when you're tired, <laughs> bad idea. Don't do it, okay? We agreed it was not a good idea to read obituaries. <laughs> we shared funny books and encouraged each other with cup half full stories. There were plenty of decisions to make. Would I get a lumpectomy or a mastectomy? I decided for the lumpectomy, removing the lump from your breast and finally and hopefully getting all the cancer out. Now lying on the hospital bed, being wheeled into the operating room, you know, I was terrified, but I was trying to channel my inner Angelina Jolie. You know, how does she make it look so easy? You know, she's an actress, that's her job to look glamorous though. But what about us mere mortals? Looking at myself in the mirror, post-surgery, covered in bandages, glamorous was not a word that came to mind. I was relieved though to hear it was stage one. The cancer had not spread to the lymph nodes. 
The bad news, there were still some precancerous cells left in the breast tissue. I had another date with my surgeon, another lumpectomy. I'm thinking, I can't afford that much more shrinkage here. You know, what am I going to be left with after this? I was praying that this would be the end of my surgery. I didn't want to rack up any more frequent flyer points at Mount St. Joseph's Hospital. Unfortunately, I had the surgery though, but my pathology report showed still some more cancerous cells left in the tissue. Okay, it was time to wave the white towel and go ahead with the mastectomy, removing all the breast tissue and then having reconstruction. More decisions to make. What kind of reconstruction? My plastic surgeon said one option is you take fat from one part of your body, like the abdomen, and you rebuild your breast with that fat. What? Move fat from your belly and add it to your breast? Why had I not heard of this before? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I told my friends about this. They were all like clamoring to donate their fat. <laughs> I said, think of the potential here. I could just see the headline, live fat transplant, Hell's, helps breast cancer patient. You know, the potential is huge here. Um, but anyways, in the end, that was not the option that was the best for me. Getting an implant was the better option for me and uh, a new lefty, as I call it. But you know, a question really bothered me. I was getting regular mammograms. Why didn't my cancer show up in the mammogram? Then I, l I learned I was pretty dense. Some of my friends here, um, I don't know, they might agree with that. Uh, no, my doctors were not trying to insult my mental sharpness. It was a fact about my breast tissue. Having dense tissue puts you at a greater risk for breast cancer. I didn't know that. Women with dense breast tissue have double jeopardy. They have a greater risk of having cancer. Whoopsie, not that one yet. They have a greater risk of having cancer and are less likely to have the cancer show up on the mammogram. Dense boobs are dangerous boobs. A mammogram is not enough. The cancer shows up as white on the x-ray, but so does dense tissue. So hard to see a snowball in a snowstorm. 40% of women have dense tissue. Now, how many women here know about the issue of dense breasts? Not, not that many, you know, and I didn't really know about it until I had the breast cancer. Why are we told about dense breasts? This was my aha moment. I said, this is the story I need to tell. This is the message that could save lives. Let me tell you about a Connecticut educator. Her name is Nancy Capello. She dutifully did her breast self-exams, got her annual mammograms. They all came back normal. But then six weeks after her mammogram, her doctor found a ridge on her breast. He said, get another mammogram, but also get an ultrasound. The mammogram didn't show anything, but the ultrasound did. She had stage 3C breast cancer. The cancer had spread to 13 lymph nodes. Nancy Capello endured a mastectomy, reconstruction, eight chemotherapy treatments, 24 radiation treatments. That was in 2004. Then she started asking questions. Why had my mammogram failed me? It was the first time that she was told that she had dense breast tissue and about how mammograms can miss the cancer. She asked her doctors, why are we not told about this? They said, well, it's not standard protocol. Radiologists do write down whether you have dense breast tissue in the reports, but it's not standard protocol to tell patients. She said about changing that. She launched, a, she launched a mission to educate women and also change the laws. She started in Connecticut, her own state. She passed a law, first of its kind in the U.S. It requires women to be notified if they have dense breast tissue. After their mammograms, they're gonna get a letter saying they have dense breast, breast tissue, and these reports, the letters will mention the potential benefits of MRI or ultrasound. Now, 24 states have laws to inform women if they have dense breast tissue. Wow, you know, here is a woman who has turned her crisis into real change. She is definitely my hero. So what's happening in Canada? Sadly, not very much. Patrick Brown, an Ontario MP, tried to start a private member's bill, but it got stuck in the Senate. I don't think it'll ever become law. Mammograms can tell women if they have dense breast tissue. You can't tell by the size or the texture. It's something that an x-ray, a mammogram, will show. But in Canada, there's no policy of letting women know if they have dense breast tissue. Knowledge 
of your risk can be scary, but it can be empowering. So I'd like to challenge you, if you do go for a mammogram, ask if you can find out if you have dense breast tissue. And you could consider then maybe getting an ultrasound. Because I did get my mammograms, but they didn't show the cancer because of my dense tissue. If women knew they had dense tissue, they could look at other options like an ultrasound. I wasn't happy about having cancer, but I was thankful that I could reach other women through my stories that aired on CTV. My story producer, Laura Evans, is here in the audience. Laura, where are you? Thank you, Laura, for helping me just open up in that story. It was, it was really hard, and we, we wrote it together, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your help in that story. You know, of the thousands of stories I've done, none have garnered more reaction than my breast cancer story and my stories about breast density. I was even trending on Twitter that day. <laughs> So I will continue to give speeches and talk one-on-one -on -one with women who have been diagnosed and are scared like I was. I'll never forget how my family and friends supported me when I really needed it. Cancer is one of the more difficult ways of getting your friends to cook for you, but it, it did work for me <laughs> in that time of need. And I'm glad I can now return that favor to others. Cancer has given me more empathy. I hope that rubs off on my sons and it stays with them long after I'm no longer tracking them with GPS. <laughs> it often takes a crisis to open our eyes. Some of us do have to learn the hard way. But you don't have to wait for a crisis to stick your neck out and tell your story and hopefully make a stronger community. Thank you.